Hi everyone and welcome. I'd like to start off by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from unceded Wongo land and my guest is speaking from the lands of the Kulin nations. I'd like to pay respects to elders past and present and remember that First Nations peoples are the original storytellers of this land. I'd like to invite everyone watching to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands you are on. Sovereignty was never ceded, and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to Toolkits Live. Tonight's session is Worlds in Formation, Imagination and Technique with Grace Chan. My name is Annie Zhang, and I am the facilitator for this year's Toolkits Fiction Program. Um, I am a writer and an editor, and my work has been published by The Big Issue and Kill Your Darlings, amongst others. I've been a Westwards Western Sydney Emerging Writer Fellow and my writing has been shortlisted for the Rachel Fenari Prize for Fiction. And in my day job, I work as an in-house editor for children's books. And I am here tonight joined by the author Grace Chan. So Grace is a speculative fiction writer and psychiatrist. Her writing explores brains, minds, technology, alien worlds, relationships, power, identity, and hidden parts of the self. Her soft cyberpunk with feelings debut novel, Every Version of You, is about staying in love after mind uploading into virtual reality. It's out now from a firm press. Her short fiction can be found in Clark's World, Lightspeed, Black Cranes, Tales of Unquiet Women, Going Down Swinging, Royalis, Andromeda Spaceways Magazine, and many other places. She's been shortlisted for the Aurealis Awards, Norma K. Hemming Award, and Viva La Novella. Um, and before we get stuck into the session, there's just a little bit of housekeeping. So Toolkits Connect is a 12-week program for writers aged 30 and under to develop their skills in a unique and exciting online environment. Toolkits is run by Express Media. Express has been around for over 30 years, developing, supporting, and promoting young writers through workshops that develop skills, through opportunities for constructive feedback and publication, like Voiceworks Magazine, and through awards and programs that recognize excellence. Toolkits Connect is generously supported by the Copyright Cultural Fund. And this session tonight will be made available on YouTube as a resource, and it will be captioned in the coming days. If you'd like to ask any questions tonight, you can do so via our new online event platform, the Express Media Zone, or you can use Twitter using the hashtag EMToolkits, or you can also use the live chat section on YouTube. And yeah, I'd be very happy for anyone to send in questions at any point during the session. And great, so let's begin. Um, Grace, perhaps, perhaps you can start off by doing a very short reading from the opening of the book. Yeah, thank you so much, Annie. And it's such a pleasure to be here and to be part of this conversation. I'll, um, I'll just read a little paragraph from the very start of every version of you. The sky's all wrong tonight. Oversaturated blue, it pixelates at the horizon into streaky seawater and is hole punched by the sun sinking towards its bloated reflection. The tide beats against the shore, one, two, three, up the sand, one, two, three, four, leaving a sine wave of foam. Taoyi sits with her legs folded beneath her, rotating a nearly empty beer bottle in her hands. Long shadows drip from the sandstone formations around her. In this tucked away cove, shielded by ruddy cliffs, she can't see the others but she can hear them laughing and shouting as they gather driftwood for a bonfire. She has let Naveen drag her here, a little out of obligation, but mostly out of habit. It's just what happens every New Year's Eve. Zach throws a party. It would feel wrong to miss it. The bottle stays ice cold against her palms, impervious to her body heat. She lifts the rim to her lips. The last gulp slices down her throat. The ocean ruffles like a silk skirt in a breeze, creased and opaque. She waits for the gust to roll into shore, to lift tendrils of hair from her neck, but it never comes. The air in Gaia is as stale as a subway tunnel. Great. Thank you so much, Grace. That's such a beautiful and striking opening. 
Um, do you think you could tell our viewers a little bit about your book, Every Version of You? Yeah, for sure. So um, Every Version of You, it's, it's a science fiction book um, and it's a tale that's set in late 21st century Australia and it's also set in this very shiny, ver very alluring virtual reality world called Gaia. Um, it focuses on the main character, Tao Yi, who is a Malaysian, Chinese, Australian woman and a migrant um, who is in her late 20s and her partner, Naveen. And what happens to their relationship and to their sense of self when there's a technology that's introduced to actually upload a human mind completely into the world of Gaia? So it's quite a science fiction hypothetical, but um, I think through this hypothetical, I'm playing with like things like, you know, change and um, love and loss as well. And sort of how, how we get a sense of who we are, what kind of things are important to us throughout our lives. And yeah, maybe just playing with ideas of what, what the near future might look like. Yeah, thank you so much, Grace. Yeah, there are so many interesting questions in the book. And yeah, I was really struck by the world in which you set the book. So I guess um, from my reading, like I saw that it took place across two worlds. Um, and the first one is what you call meat space, which is our physical world. And the main setting here is Melbourne at the very end of the 21st century in the late 2080s. And it's a time of really deep climate crisis and breakdown where our characters need to like put on air filters to even go outside. Um, can you tell us about how you went about imagining and building this future world? Yeah, so it was a process that took, it, it took a lot of time. So it took a lot of drafts and a lot of iterations to kind of layer on different aspects of the world. But I think it started for me, it started from a pretty simple place. Like for me, um, I start first from character. So I start from the main character, Tao Yi, and also her, her partner, Naveen, who is also a really important character in the narrative. So I think for me, character comes first, mm -hmm. and then the world is built around that. So I'm really thinking about um, what does the world look like for these characters and what is important for the characters to know and for the readers to know as they journey through this world. So it, it's also a bit coloured by how the characters see the world too. So what's important to tell you, obviously, the places that she lives, um, the places that she grew up in. Um, so she lives in Melbourne now, but she, she grew up in Malaysia, in Ipoh, and she migrated from Malaysia to Australia when she was 12 years old. So choosing specific locations that were relevant to the, the narrative and then building those out to, be, to feel real um, and to feel detailed and specific and grounded um, was important to me. I think it was quite challenging, particularly because I was setting setting the story in these two worlds. Just as you said, there was there's the world of late twenty first century Australia, which is quite ravaged by climate change, um, and so to convey that in a way that just didn't seem too too general or too too um, bleak. I, I guess what I tried to do was to pick specific locations that that I knew. So, for example, mm -hmm. I tried to choose a few specific places like suburbs, like, like I mentioned Dandenong and Berwick and specific locations in um, places that I knew as well. For example, the Yarra River and Burke Street Mall I chose because I, could, I felt I could write about it quite easily and I felt like it would be familiar to a lot of readers as well. Um, and I think that scene in Burke Street Mall sticks in a lot of readers' minds. Um, and also drawing on on places that I'd visited. So, for example, the Great Barrier Reef, um, Ipoh, Malaysia, was a place that um, is important in my own family history, and I visited it again during the writing of the novel. Um, 
just so I could, you know, I could sort of immerse myself in, in the location a bit and draw on specific details because I do think it is the details that, that make the world building. With the, so that was, that was the physical world. Mm. With the virtual world, that was quite different because I think a lot of it, I I got to invent, which was really fun as well. You can kind of, you know, I think that's something that draws me towards speculative fiction. Um, you get to, you know, go go wild with your imagination, and um, you're not you're not constrained by reality. Um, I think in creating the virtual reality world, though. It, it was, I actually drew on quite a lot of personal knowledge and personal feelings as well. So being a kid in the 90s and the noughties and sort of experiencing how much internet culture and technology changed really rapidly as I was a child and an adolescent, I think that certainly influenced how I built the world of Gaia. So things like, you know, dial-up internet, playing RPGs and MMORPGs, Neopets and all those kinds of things, you know, the early social media like MySpace and then progressing onto Facebook and all of that, using avatars, having having space in a 3D sort of digital environment, all of that found its way, helped me to build and imagine the world of Gaia. Um, and then yeah, imagining how people might log in and out of Gaia and making up the scientific technology around that. Um, mm -hmm. That involved a bit of kind of research to patch up the holes. <laughs> yeah, that is really, really interesting and enlightening to hear about, yeah, your imaginative processes in building these worlds. I guess, yeah, but Gaia is a really, really interesting place. Like, um, I think you say, like, in Gaia, all things are possible. Um, and this is where most of your characters spend their time. Like, they work in Gaia and they have fun there. They even eat there. Um, I guess I'm wondering, in a place where, like, seemingly anything is possible, did you have to think about, like, the rules and limitations of the world when you were building it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this was quite a challenging process to me because, as I was inventing the world of Gaia, I was thinking, you know, this is a digital space. It's an artificial space and, and technically anything is possible. We, you don't have to build a digital space that looks like our world. Um, but in the end, um, the world of Gaia resembles our world in many ways. You know, there are buildings, there are shopping centers, there are cinemas in a way, there's art mm -hmm. galleries, there's restaurants. And so, I built Gaia that way because the story needed it to resemble our world. It was sort of, uh, it's sort of a, a commentary on how we kind of replicate the the structures and the institutions that we have in our world, and um, we we do, we don't kind of dare to think too differently. Um, but but yeah, I guess I could have, you know, many people who write about digital universes. Um, write in very, very creative ways and imagine, you know, kind of dismantle, play, play with, you know, the loss of the body and dismantle um, space and time and self in, in um, very um, exciting and interesting ways. So I think writing about a digital space is um, potentially very ex um, expansive, can be very expansive. Um, I did have to, I guess, I couldn't make the world everything. So I did have to put in some boundaries and limitations, as, as, you, as you put it, to kind of define the world that I was working in. And I think you need, you definitely have to have those limitations and constraints to um, create a world and a space where then your characters can um, play in and interact in, in a meaningful way. So I guess just practical things, for example, like when people log into the virtual world, I had to think about how, how they interact with the environment. They have avatars. Um, how are the, what do the avatars look like? What do they feel like? How are they designed? Do they draw on biological data? Can you modify them in any way? 
um, in my world, they are um, somewhat regulated. Um, and then how, what are the physical limitations as well of accessing this virtual space? So thinking about things like um, what is the actual sort of um, neural virtual interface that is needed for people to access this world of Gaia? Um, how do how do the electrical impulses from the virtual world transmit to the person's brain mm -hmm. and how is the body sustained while while they're inside the world of Gaia so um I had to sort of so, so for my story I invented these sort of pods that people lie in a pretty common science fiction trope it's not something that I I invented really <laughs> it's something stolen from from many science fiction movies, there's a pod filled with gel and the gel keeps your body in, in balance and the gel is also an interface where the electrical signals can be transmitted uh, directly into a person's scalp. Um, so there's a lot of like little world building um, decisions that I had to make for that. Great. Yeah, thank you. That is really, really interesting. Did you have to do much like specific research to assist with the world building? Yeah, research in the form of like reading and watching science fiction, <laughs> mm -hmm. if that counts as research. I think that was probably okay. one of the most helpful things. Um, and, you know, I've always been quite a, a fan of various subgenres within science fiction. So um, that wasn't hard for me. I think I probably drew on various movies and television shows that I'd watched over my life. Um, and thinking about, for example, even shows like The Matrix and how they sort of interact with that virtual, mm -hmm. that artificial reality in The Matrix, and more mm -hmm. recently Black Mirror, um, and how mm -hmm. there's a lot of artificial reality in Black Mirror, and that's often depicted as, um, like, there's a little um, nodule almost that the characters attach to, their, to the sides of their heads, and, and that's how the virtual neural interface um, uh, works. Um, so thinking about the pros and cons of how that, that interface is, is depicted in different forms of media and, and what, what might work for my story. Um, I did also do a little bit of reading around, say, um, how virtual technology sort of developed in the late 20th century and the early 21st century, um, moving from, like, um, some scientific and industrial applications into gaming applications, um, and so that just helped me to think about different ways that um, the different kinds of equipment that I could use in, in, in um, creating this sort of technology. Um, yeah, and I think having a little bit of scientific, um, a little bit of a scientific framework helped as well, in particular when it came to making the uploading process, the mind uploading process sound plausible. So I was doing a bit of research around like the mind body connection and things like the human connectome project. And that kind of helped me to make it sound a bit more believable when I described the science, uh, the hypothetical science of uploading a mind into the cloud. So as you can see, my research proce process is pretty patchwork. It's sort of like, this is what the world needs. I'm going to go and like do a little bit of a, <laughs> a deep dive into this little area and then um, use that to lend, uh, to, 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 to flesh out that area of my world. Cool. Yeah, that is really great to know. I guess there is so much information that you as the writer needs to know when you're building a world, but like a book can usually only convey like a small portion of all those nitty gritty details. So how do you decide what the reader needs to know and how do you like convey that information in a way that's still engaging? Yeah, that's the sort of quintessential world building an exposition question, isn't it? Like, how do you yeah. how do you world build and how do you strike a balance without info dumping and kind of just losing the reader in irrelevant facts? Um, mm. And I think that's particularly relevant if if you're writing speculative fiction and you've got to introduce the reader to a world that's um, not within reality. It's not a world. It's a world that's quite unf unfamiliar to them and. 
you've got to quickly orient a reader to this world without completely, you know, and pique their curiosity and not completely lose them with, you know, new terminology and confusing, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> confusing geography and, and that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's tricky and it, it's a tricky thing to strike the balance. I think some of the things that, some of the core principles that I try to keep in mind is that um, we often, I think as writers, we often underestimate the reader. So we often give the reader too much information and we don't, I think it's important to trust the reader to fill in the gaps mm-hmm. with their own um their own experiences, their own background information, they, they're going to visualise the world. You give, you can just give them a few cues, um, use particular terms, you drop in particular specific um, um, pieces of language and that will evoke something for the reader. And it might not be exactly the same image that you have in your head as you're writing the story, but it will be an image that is unique to them and they will bring their own kind of story to life as they read Mm. your story. So I think that's something that I try to keep in mind as I write, that I need to trust the reader, that I don't need to, I don't need to sort of shove my specific worldview onto them. It's about trusting them to take the language and kind of world build in their own heads, a world that is unique to them. Um, I suppose a few more practical things that I try to do is um, definitely to avoid info dumping Um, and sometimes what really helps is when I have a lot of information about the world that I need to convey, I break it up so I spread it out across a chapter or across a few chapters. Um, rather than having, you know, three paragraphs of background information about, uh, you know, a, a, an organisation or or a person in, in the world. So I think that's a really simple way of avoiding info dumping, um, just breaking it up into separate short phrases or lines and dropping it more seamlessly into the action or into the dialogue or into the text. Um, I think beware of one of the faults that I tend to make also is using too much exposition in dialogue. So my editor was like, don't try not to ex- do so much world exposition in your dialogue. Keep uh, keep the dialogue natural and maybe maybe you can drop the world um, building somewhere else in, in a descriptive line here and there rather than having your characters tell the reader what the world looks like. But yes, breaking up the information um, into small, specific and unusual details. I think if you can, rather than using very general descriptions, if you can pick a small detail of the world, for example, like maybe even what like the wallpaper looks like or um, as an unusual piece of uh, an unusual item on the shelf or an unusual book or just something that the character notices, if you can choose some a detail that's more specific and unusual that can tell you something about the world. It can tell you something about what the character notices within the world, and it can do multiple functions within one um, one line. So, and I think when it's unusual, it sticks in the reader's minds a lot more as well. So, yeah, and I think if you're spreading out the world building over a scene or over a chapter or over multiple chapters. Um, If you repeat that detail, maybe bring it back in again in a future scene, um, that consistency can make your world feel like a real place. So if you've mentioned like a photograph and you bring that photograph in a couple of chapters later, the reader will be like, hey, I remember that. And and it will make the world feel, I think, a little bit more tangible. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Those are some really, really excellent pointers. Um, Are there any like non-traditional approaches that writers can take to world building? Oh, yeah, that's a really interesting one. Um, I think there are. So for me, 
I think it's nice to go about world building in a different way and to not feel like you have to go about it a certain way. Like, I think your traditional image of world building can be like, you know, spreadsheets and maps and lists and keeping lots and lots of documents about how the world looks. And that can feel a little bit cerebral and a bit um, methodical and maybe take a little bit of the, the you know, I have spreadsheets and I have <laughs> I have lists, but and they do serve a function, but and and it can be quite fun to do that world building. But I think for me, what really helps is to that comes later, that all the details come later. The start of it comes for me from the character, and again coming back to to the character and how they see the world and what piques their interest in the world? What is relevant to the character? What is their viewpoint? How do they see the world? Um, are they, an, you know, everyone's a bit of an unreliable narrator. So thinking about um, what aspects of the world stand out to them and how they see certain parts of the world, I think is a nice way to start. Um, I feel like, you know, for me, yeah, inhabiting that character is the, the starting point. Um, that's the that's the core of it. And then you kind of build the world around that and see the world through their eyes. A lot of what I do is use um, draw on multiple senses to to create the world. So I think sometimes we can focus a lot on vision and what the world looks like. And I tend to fall into that trap too. I'm quite a visual writer. Um, but I think it's really helpful to think about all the other senses and you know what what the world tastes like what it smells like mm. um what it sounds what different things sound like you know i have my characters think about what the gel in the pod smells like and what it tastes like um i am quite a tactile writer as well so i notice that when i write my characters i very much kind of embody them and mm. i dr describe a lot of their their physical embodied feelings so touch tactility internal sensations um that comes through quite a lot in my writing and I notice that sometimes I have to edit a little bit of that out because I'm I do tend to include a lot of those embodied descriptions in my writing um, but I think they can be useful as well um, I think they can be a nice way to create empathy with the character and um, really make the reader feel like they are um, they're, they're physically in in the world that you're building. So, yeah, other ways to build a world non-traditionally. Um, I guess one thing I would say is that, um, and this has probably come through a bit in what I've said already, but don't feel that you have to build the world all at the start. So, um, I think follow the narrative, follow the story, follow the characters, and build the world around that so you don't you don't have to have the whole world built from the start I definitely sort of built it as I went and rebuilt it as I <laughs> redrafted um, and just acknowledge that you will have to iron out like inconsistencies as, as you edit great yeah thank you um, oh I have I, one more point sorry oh, I, I, yes, I really like this one I think um, this came through a little bit in what I said already as well but when you're world building try to draw on what works for me is that I, I try to draw on the personal and the specific. So really like including elements and things in the world that you feel you feel called to include, what excites you, what do you really want to see in this world? Um, mm -hmm. So following your gut a little bit and following your unconscious, I think, just going with what excites you and what tickles your fancy. Um, pull that into the world. I think that makes the world interesting and then build, build your world around, around where your, your passion and your excitement takes you. Hi, yeah, those are some very useful perspectives. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting to hear that character is something that is so central for you. Um, do you have any, can you tell us a bit more about your approach to like crafting characters in a memorable and distinctive way? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely think that um, most of my stories start from uh, from a place of character and the narrative and the world grows around the characters. 
it's I think you always worry as a as a writer how do I make my characters feel real <laughs> mm-hmm. and you never really know because it's um it's hard it, you you also want to do that thing where you want to write a fully fleshed character but you don't want you convey that you convey that subtly through their interactions through mm-hmm. their dialogue and you build that piece by piece over the course of the novel not really through kind of info dumping she was a quiet but strong character <laughs> you know <laughs> so i try i think when i'm building my characters i very much um try not to box them in from the start so i don't i try not to give them particular labels at the very start i don't try to label them as um you know she's outgoing and he's reserved and um i don't try to apply any i i try to avoid using labels for my characters when i'm when i'm in that phase of designing them and figuring out who they are i think a lot of the process of the writing is how i discover who the characters are so it's writing them and um seeing you know drawing those core scenes together where um we're actually writing out those core scenes helps me to discover who the characters are i some of the questions that i do find useful when i'm thinking about my characters is i try to think about what their unconscious motivations are um i find it quite fun to think about like what are the things that make you do or act in certain ways do certain things or act in certain ways what are those motivators and particularly what are the motivators that that people aren't even aware of so those unconscious motivators i think that's really interesting to think about for each of your characters so why are they the way they are like what are the earlier life events that have shaped them um what do they what is what do they yearn for what do they want the most maybe without even realizing that they want it what do they fear and what do they most fear out of everything and maybe that's something that they can't even acknowledge what do they uh what what kind of patterns of behavior do they tend to repeat do they tend to fall into and yeah i guess characters are never in isolation they're always kind of push and pull in terms of the people around them the relationships around them so what are they seeking in their relationships like what are they trying to get from the people around them what are they looking for um in their romantic relationships in their friendships in their work relationships that kind of thing so i feel like those questions are quite useful um to me yeah absolutely they are very good questions to ponder um a small choice that struck me about the book um was that it's in the present tense um and this is an indulgent question because um this is a tense i'm really often drawn to but i always hear people particularly in the genre space saying that it can feel quite alienating so i'm just curious like what made you choose to write the book in the present tense that's so interesting to hear um i also feel like i'm quite drawn to the present tense too <laughs> and i did have to think about whether or not i wrote every version of you in the past tense or present tense or something else mm. <laughs> um i wrote it in the present tense for a few reasons i think yeah it's you're probably right i think that the present tense c- does come across as less traditional so a lot of fantasy books in particular i think will write in the past tense um i think that just lends a more traditional feel to those fantasy narratives perhaps um and people are more I, i suppose many readers are more familiar with the past tense so they fall into it more easily and there's a sense of familiar familiarity and i think it may work well for stories where it feels like the narrative has already happened so mm-hmm. perhaps um fantasies that take place or speculative fiction that takes place in an alternate reality that feels maybe somewhat historical um i feel like past tense can work really well in those situations i chose present tense for every version of you because i felt like it made the the events feel 
a lot more immediate and a lot more tangible. Mm. And I wanted that for my book. I also feel that feel that it it jolts you a little bit more than past tense. It sort of like makes the reader go, oh, it's happening right now in front of me. Um, it hasn't all, and it kind of makes you feel like it hasn't all happened yet. Like it's it's unfolding right in front of you. Um, like the events are still being written mm -hmm. and it's still a bit up up for you know it's it's an un, it's an unknown it's an open question about what's going to happen next so it brings yeah I, I feel like it for a story that's set in the future you know my story set about 50 60 years in the future I think it's it works quite well it sort of brings I hope <laughs> it brings the future into the present and makes it feel very immediate and um, mm. yeah, particularly for a narrative where I'm wanting, I'm wanting this, although it's this alternate hypothetical future, I'm wanting it to feel quite relevant to today and to make you feel like, oh, this, this could happen or this is quite close to what's happening today. So that's why I felt that present tense worked well. Great. Yeah, that is a wonderful perspective. I feel very heartened by that personally. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. Yeah. Um, and did you think much about the structure of the book when you wrote it? Like the, the rhythm of like maybe the overall narrative and were there like any particular structural decisions that you made? Yeah. Um, I did. Like Although, although at the start I write quite freely, I do become quite a methodical writer as well. So um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the program Scrivener or Scrivener. I think it's, oh, yes. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I tried Scrivener for the first time when I was writing this novel and I ended up writing most of it in Scrivener and that mm -hmm. allowed me to have all my scenes kind of laid out and like have a little title for each scene and I could then really easily organize them into chapters and into parts and reshuffle mm. them when I needed. So I what helped me was to actually divide the novel into four parts or four acts and mm. that helped me to get a sense of the overall narrative arc and those four acts actually made their way into the final novel. There's, there's still four parts, which is kind of nice that that overall arc has stayed there. Um, so the first arc is, the first part is kind of setting the scene, um, introducing us to the readers and to, uh, to the characters and to the world, and also going into Taoyi and Naveen's backstory, like how they met and their, the, you know, the early years of their relationship. The second part is like um, when the uploading technology is introduced and there's the technology advances very rapidly. And then the third part is the focus is on how um, the uploaded characters change very quickly and the world changes very quickly. And um, then the fourth part is sort of the final chapter of Tao Yi's journey. So mm -hmm. that helps me to kind of feel um yeah it kind of grounded the narrative in this in this arc um so I think having having that overarching structure helped me and then within that having like chapters and scenes or beats I was a lot more I could be a, mo a lot more flexible with that I could have short chapters and long chapters and just play all around within that space um and be it'd be a lot, a lot more flexible within that space um I write short fiction as well, so I like to kind of treat each scene as a little bit of a short story and um, focus in on each scene as as a mini story, um, mm -hmm. where each each scene kind of serves multiple functions. So you can like set it set it in a new place, so you can introduce the reader to more of the world. Um, like maybe having two characters walking through the city and talking, so you get to see the city and. Um, you know, advance the narrative as well. Um, but yeah, I really, I really don't feel like you need to stick to a particular, you, a, a particular structure or a particular arc, like um, trust, uh, like it was a process, but learning to trust like the, the arc and the structure that you want in your narrative, even if that's not 
um, a traditional one or it doesn't, you know, follow the typical, you know, rising tension, conflict, mm -hmm. tension kind of arc, it's okay. I think we need different kinds of narrative structures in our fiction. Um, one, one interesting thing was like when just after my novel was accepted for publication, my editor, who is really fantastic, she she did suggest changing the structure quite dramatically. So instead of having it as a more of a linear structure, she suggested um, changing it to start like towards the end and have mm -hmm. it told in alternating chapters where every second chapter flashed back to, <laughs> to past events. And I really didn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it. I didn't want to do it because partly because um, I wanted, like with the present tense stuff, I wanted everything to feel really immediate. Like I wanted to feel like it was all unfolding right in front of the reader and like the reader kind of is taken along for the journey. Um, hmm. And there's a sense that anything could happen. I think if you start from the end, there's a feeling that everything's already happened. So it's kind of foreclosed. Um, so I didn't really want that feeling. And also maybe a personal thing. I I think some stories do alternating chapters really well, but I think it can be really hard to jump back and forth in time and change viewpoints. So I was a bit nervous about <laughs> doing that. <laughs> Wow, that is really interesting. I'm glad that you fought back because I feel like that structure has become very popularized. I feel like a lot of people are doing that alternating timeline thing. But yeah. 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 Um, do you have any particular approach to like language and to sentence level prose? Mm. Yeah. I think every writer is so different with their approach to sentence level prose and oh, I mean that's the beauty of it <laughs> everyone is different for me I do pay a lot of attention to it and I think that's because um the prose gives me such joy like I want every sentence to earn its place and I think that's also partly why I'm drawn to writing short fiction as well because short fiction is a great um a, a great sort of exercise for kind of practicing that that prose that that very specific um and intentional use of prose where every sentence and every word you ha earns its place perhaps plays multiple functions and so for me like i i really like my prose to be aesthetically pleasing at, at the line level as well as to convey a precise meaning um, and I want to feel, I want the reader to feel that. I want the reader to feel that the prose is precise and also lovely. I feel like that's like <laughs> my my sort of gift to the reader. I'm trying to honour the reader in that way. So, and I think that's also part of the joy of the craft for me. So I think I can sometimes get a little bit too obsessive about the prose. So I think sometimes you can stray a little bit too far on the side of obsessing about the prose to the detriment of the actual writing process and it can sometimes hold you back from maybe letting loose with your creativity so i think striking a balance is um is key <laughs> yeah that's a great that's a great way of going about it cool um Oh, we have a question from the audience. So you mentioned discovering who the characters are through writing those key scenes. Did your characters surprise you or change the way you had written them at conception? And how did that affect plot and arcs? Yeah. Did the characters surprise you or change the way you had written them at conception? Um, yes, in some ways, I think um so a lot of the key scenes that I wrote when I was crafting the novel was um the two main characters Taoyi and Naveen and like especially how they met as young people so in the earliest scenes they're about 19 or 20 years old and they meet and they get to know each other very quickly and then like Naveen um re reveals that he has a chronic illness and so 
there's um, some medical treatments that take place as well. So I think that they they kind of, it was an interesting process because I felt like I got to know the characters or the characters kind of built themselves um, through my writing um, and I figured out who they were. So gradually I got the sense of who Naveen was um, in terms of his personality and who Tao Yi was in terms of his personality. And they felt like it sort of felt like making friends with them. It sort of felt like getting to know them in the way that you might get to know a friend. Um, and I think you kind of need that depth of understanding of your characters if you're writing a longer form piece, like a novel. Um, so I think that drafting and redrafting process helped me to understand the characters more. Um, it didn't completely change my plot arc. So the key components of my plot arc have stayed the same from the start to the end. Um, but I think there were aspects about the characters that emerged as I wrote them. Um, for example, like the way that, like Naveen's illness, I think, and like um, how he, he responds to that in terms of um, his sense of his body, his self-confidence and his relationship to the digital world. I think that was something that really came out as I wrote his character. Um, and then Tao Yi and the way that she's tied to him um, through the things that they experience together, like how she looks after him when he's recovering and the guilt that she feels sometimes and the echoes of like being a carer. So being a carer for her mother and then being a carer for Naveen those were things that I that came out as I wrote the characters. So, yeah, in it didn't completely change the direction of the plot, um, but it there were aspects of my characters that kind of surprised me or helped me to understand them better as I wrote them. Great, thank you so much. Um, Let's talk maybe a little bit about your publication journey and how that happened. Um, could you tell us about that? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, I can. So what happened? So I started writing this novel in 2018. Um, so about five years ago now, it's about the middle of 2018. And I have been writing stuff since I was a kid, like many other writers. And there were a lot of like novels and short stories that I'd started and didn't finish or I didn't feel they were good enough to finish. And so it's certainly been a lifelong process. In 2018, I had an inadvertent break from work and I decided to give this writing thing another go. And so I actually started writing a fair bit of short fiction, short speculative fiction in particular. And I made a point to start um, like intentionally reading more speculative fiction and short speculative fiction as well. And I went along to a few different um, literary and genre conventions as well. I started writing this book. It was actually a short story idea at first. Um, and I wrote it as a short story. It became quite a long short story. So it was about 8,000 words, uh, which is, it is pretty long for a short story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Most places wouldn't accept it. <laughs> um, and then I, I sent it off, I think, to a couple of genre places. It didn't bite. And then I developed it into a novella. For, and I submitted it to Viva La Novella, which is a novella mm -hmm. prize run by Seizure. See, um, I hope it's still running. I think it is. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic prize for novellas in particular. I was shortlisted for Viva La Novella, and that was like the first big thing to happen mm -hmm. to me, one of the first big things to happen to me in terms of my writing journey. So it was a real confidence booster um, and gave me a bit more of a sense of a bit more confidence in my own voice. I didn't win the prize, but um, the editor at Seizure gave me some really lovely detailed feedback and suggested that I turn it into a novel. And so mm -hmm. I spent 
quite a few months rewriting it into a novel. Um, after that, to cut a long story short, I was I pitched to uh, my the agent who eventually became my agent, and um, after a few months, I wasn't sure if she would sign me, but she did sign me, and yeah, and then we went on sub to um, a few different publishers, and fortunately, um, a firm press signed my novel. And after that, it was still a process of quite a few structural edits and then line edits before, um, before you know, we felt it was ready for publication. So that is the short version of the journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I find it really interesting um, that, like, um, a science fiction novel has managed to um, be so celebrated um, in the Australian literary sphere because I feel like for a long time it felt like there wasn't a big space for genre fiction or like more specifically speculative fiction it's, and even to be published in Australia by an Australian publisher I feel like um, a lot of genre writers here tend to look overseas and from my perception I think deals are often made like in the US and the UK and then the books get distributed here um, so was it difficult for you to kind of secure that local publisher and did you come up against any barriers or challenges? Yeah, I, th I think that's my perception too. Like there's, I feel like speculative fiction traditionally hasn't been much celebrated and much awarded in Australia. I think that maybe that's changing. Um, yeah. And I feel like, like the divisions between genre and literary fiction, there's, they're so unhelpful for writers. I think when we write, we're not thinking about those labels. Like um, we're just writing what we want to write. Um, and for me, that was science fiction. And what I, what I thought fit into the science fiction category. Um, but, you know, thinking about other, you know, amazing authors out there, there's so many works that kind of span genres. So there's so many works in the literary sphere that, are called literary fiction and get shortlisted for awards, but they have speculative elements as well. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, writers like Kazuo Ishiguro and Margaret Atwood and recently um, uh, Shehan Karuna Tilaka, The Seven Moons of Mali Almeida, which was recently um, won the Booker Prize. Like, it's a speculative book. <laughs> um, it takes place with, you know, in the afterlife and there's ghosts and, you know, um, spirits and, and, you know, hungry ghosts and pretas and all that kind of thing. But it's also considered liter literary. And then there's other books that are really big in the genre space, but you know, they're what's, you know, I think they have lots of um, valuable literary elements too. Um, so I think those, those divisions can, for me, I find them quite confusing to navigate as an early, early career writer. Um, I always thought of my book as quite science fiction. And I always thought of myself as fitting into the kind of genre space so i i sent stories out to genre magazines um for publication um but i suppose i sort of felt like i straddled two worlds as well so i did also sometimes send some stories to literary magazines and occasionally um did get one or two published so i I was always kind of in between and not sure where I fit in terms of the worlds of literary and genre fiction. For me, I think I I just wanted to give it a go, getting published in Australia. Um, I knew that it might be tricky and speculative fiction might not, you know, there might not be an interest in speculative fiction. Um, it might be hard to find an agent, to find a publisher. But I knew that... I thought that for my book, it would be best to try to be published in Australia, particularly because the characters, um, you know, they, although they have, many of them are mixed heritage and um, are members of diaspora, they live um, for some part in this land. Um, so I thought I'd give it a go. And I think, 
you know, I was lucky. It worked out for me. Um, I think recently there has been more of an interest in speculative fiction in, in the general literary sphere in Australia. Um, and if your work can be kind of pitched as a little bit more on the literary side, <laughs> I think every version of you, um, fortunately, it can kind of um, be pitched as a little bit more of having a bit more of a literary bent because it's quite character, maybe because it's quite character focused and it has a few of those kind of uh, maybe softer, um, more reflective themes. Um, it can fit. Uh, it's, it's one of those that kind of sits at the border perhaps between um, genre and literary. It's kind of in that in-between zone. Um, so I think that helped it to um, find an agent and find a publisher in, in here in Australia. Ooh, okay, that's really good to hear. Um, and another audience question. Roughly how many drafts had you done of the novel when you pitched it to the agent that went on to become your agent? <laughs> This is really interesting. So I, this is quite unusual, I think. So don't take my experience as the usual. Um, I really winged it when I pitched to my agent and to thinking back now, I cringe a little bit at how not ready I was. <laughs> so I actually went along to Emerging Writers Festival in 2018 and I signed up for like those five minute um, speed pitches. And I pitched my, I pitched actually a short story collection. So mm -hmm. I had some works written and published and some that were still in progress. And I just thought, what have I got to lose? I'll just go for it. I pitched to her. To my amazement, she was interested and said, send me more of your stuff. I sent my stuff to her and I didn't hear anything for a few months. So I just thought, oh, maybe nothing happened. Uh, you know, maybe she's not interested. Um, but then I just kept submitting my stuff elsewhere to publications and then Viva La Novella happened and so a few months later my agent said okay I'll sign you and and, um, and that that was around the time that I was writing the novel the novella into a novel um, so it was a bit funny like the no novel actually wasn't finished when I signed the agent. Hmm. Yeah that's a really interesting experience. Hmm. Um, yeah, have you managed to find like a community of like genre writers or speculative fiction writers in Australia? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I do feel like um, for me, the worlds of um, genre or speculative fiction writers and literary fiction can sometimes feel quite separate. Mm -hmm. um, there, I ha yeah, I have, I think I have, um, had the chance to be involved with a, a few different um, genre fiction communities, both like more locally and also internationally. Um, there have been some online groups um, that have been, that were really helpful at the start of my journey. Um, groups of like Australian speculative fiction writers who were many of whom some some were published and others um, like me at that time were just kind of at the very start of my journey, and things like following um, some of the um, speculative fiction magazines and conventions in Australia helped me to get a sense of what was going on as well. So things like the Aurealis Awards and the Canberra Speculative Fiction Guild. Um, who put out some publications uh, and anthologies from time to time. Following the key um, genre magazines in Australia, like Aurealis Magazine, Andromeda Spaceways, recently Etheria Magazine has cropped up and become quite active as well. Um, so keeping track of, like, reading those magazines, um, keeping track of, like, you know, reading some of the stories that got shortlisted for the Aurealis Awards, and then going along to some genre cons as well um, helped me to kind of understand what was happening in the genre space and what ideas were being thrown around and gave me a lot of inspiration and um, community as well as I was starting out. More internationally, I think jumping on Twitter before it became more of the, <laughs> uh, before it 
you know, it's become a bit of a echo chamber nowadays. But um, when I jumped on Twitter a few years ago, it was also quite a uh, helpful space to be in as an emerging writer. Um, I think there's a lot of international um, communities for um, BIPOC and queer SFF writers that um, are very supportive and um, can, yeah, bring a, a, a nice sense of community to writers who are starting out. Um, there were like magazines and also like online conventions that I hopped into at the start of my writing journey, which really helped me with my craft and also knowing um, what markets were out there. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. We'll probably have to wrap things up here. And thank you so much to everyone watching for submitting questions and engaging. And thank you so much, Grace, for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, everyone should check out every version of you which you can purchase from your local bookshop. I think it's been optioned for film, which is very exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's very yeah. exciting. <laughs> yes. Um, and yeah, this session will be available on YouTube as a resource and will be captioned in the coming days if you'd like to revisit any of tonight's conversation. And the next Toolkits Live session will take place at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, 27th of June. And our digital storytelling facilitator, Rory Green, will sit down with Naftali Faulkner to discuss world building through games live on Extress Media's YouTube. Thank you so much, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs>